Have you ever noticed how many warning labels there are out there? Have you ever noticed that? I know this week as I was preparing for the message, I was thinking a lot about warnings as we're talking about prophets. And one of the things that come to mind was warning labels. And uh, so I thought, you know, maybe a fun way to kind of start out our, our uh, discussion here this morning, our talk, is to kind of look at some warning labels that are out there. And, and actually, before I do that, though, I, there's a, did you know that there's actually an organization that keeps track of warning labels? I was looking on Google and realized that uh, there is actually an organization that looks for warning labels because of the effects that it has on business. So, I mean, warning labels are a big deal, right? And so... Uh, here, here's one warning label. We'll throw this one up first. Um, is, is it coming? Okay, we don't have the first one. All right, well, let's go to the second one. All right, so um, th this one here, uh, if you look really close, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's a picture of a stroller, okay? It's a stroller that's folded up. But if you look at the very top of the warning, it says, warning, always remove child from stroller before folding. Yeah, I, I, you would think that we would know that one already, right? But maybe not, okay? How about the next one here? All right, now you might think, all right, that's a cute little kid, and he's wearing his, his Batman outfit. But there's actually, uh, in the packaging, if you look, it actually says that the cape does not actually allow the user to fly. <laughs> yes, that is, sorry kids, there's no flying Batman cape for you. I'm, I apologize. All right, how about this one? Uh, this picture cracks me up. Do not hold the wrong end of a chainsaw. <laughs> there, yeah, that, that's probably uh, a pretty obvious one, but hey, you got to have those signs on there. I think we have another one here. All right, how about this one? Touching wires causes instant death, $200 fine. I don't think you need to worry about paying the $200 fine if you touch the wires. I mean, these are some of the crazy warning signs that are out there. And there are a lot of signs we see that, that often don't seem very necessary, but we know, we all know that there are times, and believe me, the reason why they have these signs is probably somebody did it, right? There are times, though, when we need those signs, we need a warning, because if we don't receive the warning, there could be a dire consequence as a result. A few years ago, there was a book that came out, we'll throw it up here, and, and this one's interesting, Over the Edge, Death in Grand Canyon. Uh, some really uplifting reading material, right? And, um, but in this book, it, it's really interesting that, uh, and I love the picture, don't you? Like, you've got this beautiful, like, rainbow, and there's a planes hitting each other, and I cut off part of the picture because there was, like, a skull in it and stuff. I'm like, this is the weirdest cover I've ever seen in my life. But anyway, in, in this book, it talks about all of the different things that's happened over the the recent history, anyway, of the Grand Canyon, how people have died in plane crashes and, and whatnot. But of course, the, the, the biggest cause of death in the Grand Canyon is when people get a little too close to the edge. You know, they've got to have that awesome picture, right, of the Grand Canyon, and then someone falls and they meet their death. Um, and, and the funny thing is, is that all over the Grand Canyon, there's these signs that tell people, don't get close to the edge, don't get close to the edge. But nonetheless, they still do. I can remember uh, back when I was in um, Israel about, it's been 15 years ago, uh, we were going up Masada. And if you don't know anything about Masada, it was a fortress that the Israelites had uh, built uh, around the time of King Herod. And during that period, um, they had built this, this mountain. It was up on this mountain. And, and so since then, they've built uh, a ramp that comes down. I didn't go up it. I took a cable car up because that was too much work going up to it. But, you know, I let gravity kind of help me go down. And, but it was funny, I can remember, and I took a picture of it, and I didn't bring it with me today. I should have brought that. But, but on the mountain, it had this picture that said, um, be careful, steep edge, do not step over. And I mean, and I'm standing like from here to the edge of the stage, and it drops a couple hundred feet, you know. And, it, and I'm thinking to myself, how obvious, that's obvious that I don't want to do that. But nonetheless, I'm sure somebody did, Right. But we need these signs sometimes in our life to warn us. Sometimes we need warning signs. But the thing is, is when we see so many of the warning signs, we have the tendency to not pay a whole lot of attention to them. And what I want us to, to think of today is, is the Bible and then the story as we've gone through, and here we are in week 15, is that God is giving us warning signs throughout the Bible. He's telling us, avoid danger. 
Stay away from the edge of the cliff. I'm trying to protect you. But nonetheless, when we get so accustomed to reading the Bible and looking at it all the time and reading it, we, we just um, we, we take it for granted and we don't realize the warning that God's trying to give us. And part of the people that God has put in the Bible to provide warnings are the prophets. If you look in um, 1 Chronicles 36, 15, and 16, it says this. It says, The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them. He's talking about the Israelites. Sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. See, he cared about them. He was trying to warn them, don't go over the cliff. But look what it said in verse 16. But they mocked God's messengers. They despised his words and scoffed at the prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people. And there was no remedy. That's who the prophets were. They were the signposts. They were the, they were the messengers. As a matter of fact, the word prophet, you can, you'll see it throughout the scriptures. It's kind of, there's different words that are used to describe who a prophet is. A prophet's a messenger or a seer or a watchman. So, so their job was to warn the people. You know, we often just think of prophets as simply... Um, People that just told us about the future. And, and yes, for many of the prophets, that was uh, an aspect of what God called them to do. But prophets were often people who warned. They were preachers. They, they were trying to help the people to help them avoid uh, a, a bad outcome in their life of, of themselves personally, but also in their nation. And so we're going to look at one prophet in particular today, but we'll also touch on a couple others briefly and the one that we're going to talk about primarily today, I'm sure you've heard of before, we're going to talk about Elijah, but we'll also make quick reference, really quick, to both Ezekiel and Hosea. Those are probably two you might not know quite so well. And, and it all starts in 1 Kings chapter 16. Uh, if you remember last week, just to kind of do a, a little bit of a quick summary from what happened last week, remember King Solomon died, and Solomon had, had a woman problem, right? Right? Uh, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had followed after the gods of all of these other wives. They had pulled him away from the true God. And so because of that, God said, you know what? Your son, Rehoboam, is not going to be on the throne. Jeroboam, one of your advisors, will. I'm going to have him be the next king. Well, Solomon didn't like that. He pursued Solomon, or, or Solomon pursued Jeroboam. Uh, but Jeroboam hid out until Solomon died. So when Solomon dies, Jeroboam comes back to Rehoboam, who is, has pretty much taken, taken control. And he tells him, he says, listen, the people are tired of all the taxation, being overworked. We need rest. We need some peace. And, and so rather than Rehoboam listening to the wise counsel of, of the elders, he listened to his friends. And his friends told him, he says, you need to double down on these people. Show them who's boss. And so that's what he does. And so because of that, the nation divides. So Jeroboam goes with the ten northern tribes and creates the nation of Israel. And then we have the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin that create the kingdom of Judah that, um, that Rehoboam is in charge of. So we have, we have this division that's now taking place. And, and when we read it, when, we, when I mentioned it last week, both Rehoboam and Jeroboam weren't exactly uh, the best, okay? As a matter of fact, Jeroboam, uh, God said that Jeroboam was the worst there had been up until that point. Well, I would like to be able to tell you this week that things have gotten better, all right? But unfortunately, they haven't. Because when we come into 1 Kings chapter 16, we'll start off in verse 29, we run into another king who, well, he, I don't know if he won or two or a hundred ups, um, king, uh, king Rehoboam and Jeroboam, all right? When we look here, it says, In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab... The son of Omri became the king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. And then look at this verse. It says, Ahab, the son of Omri, what? He did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. So things have gotten actually worse, right? And so things have gotten worse. And then in verse 31, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, but he also married Jezebel, the daughter of the Ethbel, Ethbel king of the Sidonians, and he began to serve Baal and worship him. So, so things have gotten worse. Now Ahab is in charge. His wife Jezebel is a, is a total idol worshiper. She's not from Israel. She's an evil woman. She's had the prophets of God uh, persecuted and killed. And so God says, you know what? He says enough is enough. 
enough's enough. I, I, can't, I, I can't continue this. And so he sends Elijah, the prophet Elijah, to pass along some news. And here's what he says. Elijah says, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. In other words, you're not going to have any rain for your crops. You're going to have this humongous drought and it's going to be bad. And the only way that it's going to end is when I say it's going to end. Now that's some, that's some bold words for, for this guy to come up to a king and tell him that, but that's exactly what he does. You know, throughout the Old Testament, it seems like a, a constant theme throughout the Old Testament is idolatry. Have you noticed that? Especially here in these last few weeks, we see idolatry pop up over and over and over again. The first two commandments of the Ten Commandments deal with idolatry. There are a thousand verses in the Old Testament that refer to idolatry. There's only four commands that are contained within the Old Testament that, that, um, that bring about the death penalty, and one of them is idolatry. So idolatry is a big deal to God. God takes it very seriously, and, and we might wonder why it's such a big deal. Why is this such a big deal to God? Because idolatry takes away the glory from God. The glory that only belongs to Him, when it's taken away from Him, that is a serious thing. Really, if you, if you think about it, when we look at the story, I, I, I thought of this little phrase, the story is about His glory. That is what the story should be about. But unfortunately, we see throughout the Old Testament that that's not what it's about. And for us, idolatry and the whole discussion of it, I've mentioned this before in other sermons, we, we kind of skip over it because we don't think we really do it. Um, it. It's interesting. There was a gentleman, I was reading something some, uh, here a little bit ago, and there was this guy that, that was from here in the United States, and he went over to India, and he went to the living room of a, of a person and in their living room, they had this, this picture, this, this statue of Buddha. And, and what was interesting is that in the living room, they had all the chairs kind of set up, you know, kind of with this uh, statue in front of them. And, and he thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know, that they would have all the TVs, or all, not the TVs, all the chairs kind of stacked up in front of this, this Buddha. But then, he, but, but then he came back and said, but really, is that no different in our own living rooms, right? Because we have all the TV or all the chairs and we have the TV right there. It, it, you know, it's, it's an interesting thought. We laugh at people and why they set up their chairs or in front of their Buddha. But, but the question is, maybe television has become that for some of us. It, it's really not that different, maybe, in some ways. And so really, when we look at idolatry, it comes down, it comes down to this. Where do you put your hope? Where is your hope? What holds the seat of glory, the seat of peace in your life? Who or what is writing your story? That, that's what it comes down to. Is it the television? Is that where you go to feel good? Is it your spouse? Are you trying to find completion in that person? Is it in money, trying to find security in it? Is it in popularity so that you'll be known? What is your idol? What is robbing God of his glory in your life? What I want to do here is, is just to take a moment, and I'm going to borrow from someone. There was a guy, a preacher back in the 1600s, so we're going back a few years. His name was David Clarkson, and David Clarkson, he wrote this sermon back then to help listeners identify what idols are in their lives, and he actually did it by asking questions, and so I'm going to ask the same questions he asked those people then. And here's the first question, if we're going to identify the idol in our life, the first one is, what are you most disappointed with right now in your life? What are you most disappointed with? Are you disappointed with your career? Are you disappointed with your sex life? Are you disappointed with your family and your, or your marriage? I mean, what are you disappointed with? Because whatever you are disappointed with points to something you put your hope in. Now, don't get me wrong, there's some disappointment that's natural in life. But is it a constant disappointment? Is it something that's always nagging at your mind and at your heart? Is it constant? Is this, and if it is, maybe you've put your hope in it rather than your hope in God. You know, maybe, maybe another way I could ask, it, ask you this question is this one. All right. What do you complain about the most? Think about it. What do you complain about the most? Do you complain about politics a lot? Maybe it's because you're putting your hope in politics and they're disappointing you. 
Do you complain about other people a lot? I don't know, maybe someone in your family. Is your hope in them or is it in God? You see what I'm saying? Where do you place your hope? Where are, what are you most disappointed with right now? Second question for you to think about. What do you sacrifice for? I mean, this is how you know who your God is. What do you sacrifice your time, your resources for? Do you sacrifice so that you could have that car? Do you sacrifice so you could have that house? Or do you sacrifice for that sport or that leisure activity? Whatever it is. What are you sacrificing for? Because really, if you think about it, it's no different than sacrificing before an idol, right? You're sacrificing to something that, it, that brings you joy and happiness, when our joy and happiness should only be in Christ, in God himself. How about the third one here? What do you worry about? What do you worry about? What is it, what is it that scares you? What are you scared about a lot? I mean, has it ever, uh, have you ever been scared? Well, if I lose this person or I lose this thing, then my life just isn't worth living. Okay? Now, I don't think any of us would maybe openly say that, but I think in our lives at some point we think, if I lose this person or I lose this thing, then my life isn't worth living. You know, it might be our kids, right? If I lost, you know, Lord forbid, if one of us, we lost one of our kids, well, we say, well, life is no worth living because I lost my child. Is our hope in our child or is our hope in Christ? Where do you place your hope? What do you worry about? What do you sacrifice for? How about the fourth one here? Where do you go when you are hurt? Where do you go when you are hurt? You know, I think this is a big one here. Where do you go to find comfort? Do you go to find comfort in the fridge? Comfort food, right? Is that where you go to find some comfort? Some people find comfort in drinking. Some people find comfort in drugs. Some people find comfort through television where they can just go numb and they don't have to think, right? Where do you go to find your comfort? There's, there's a... Be, I mean, where we go, where we go for comfort reveals where our hope is. There was a story, back, uh, a neat little story. There was a little boy who would come home from school. And every day he would just come to his mom and he would just talk about how awesome and amazing his teacher is. I, I just love her. She just, she helps me out with my work. She just, she takes really good care of us. I love this teacher. And so, of course, mom's getting a little insecure, Right. I mean, well, why aren't, why aren't you saying this stuff about me? I'm your mom, right? And so one day mom decides she goes to school to volunteer and probably trying to figure out, okay, is this teacher quite as good as what I thought? And, and of course she goes and finds the teacher is. She's really nice and all that. And they, they go out on the playground. And as they're out on the playground, uh, the, mom's, her little boy, he falls down. He, he comes down a slide and he falls off and he hurts himself and he stops crying. And so when he when he starts running, who does he run to? He, he doesn't run to the teacher, he runs to his mom. See, that's where he finds his comfort, right? And it's in that moment that mom found out that she really, mad, that she really does matter to him more than the teacher. See, you get what I'm saying? Where you go for your comfort reveals where your hope is. Are you going to God when you're hurt? Are you going to God when you're in pain? Or are you trying to find other things to fill that hole, to find that comfort? That, that's, that's the question for us here today. How about this one? Number five. What makes you mad? What makes you angry? Uh, does your team lose? Does your team lose and it ruins your whole week? You know what? My team lost last week. Yeah. yeah I hear your little laughs. I, that's, I, oh, sorry. Did that just come out? My team lost last week. But I, I will say, I was proud of myself. I was only upset. My wife would tell you, I was only upset for like five or ten minutes, right? I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't too upset. But you know, today there's going to be football games. But you know what I'm talking about? But we're talking about things way bigger than a football game. I'm asking you, what are the things in your life that you're angry about? Uh, you know, one of the ones that, that I think that I struggle with, and I think has become my God in a sense is I don't like it when I'm disrespected. It's become my God. And so whenever I'm disrespected, I get angry. And that's wrong. It's become my God. So, so what is it that you get angry with? What is it that, that causes you to get angry? Because that just might be your God. How about this one? Number six. 
What brings you the most joy? What is it, what is it that makes you laugh? Now, th- this one, I will say, this question here is the trickiest one. Because some of the good, some of the good things, uh, some of the things we have in our life, they're good. They're, they're very good things. But the problem is, is we start putting our hope in the thing rather than in the person who provides that. We find joy in that sport or in that person or in that activity rather than finding our joy in Christ, the one who provides it for us, right? And so so who is it or what is it that brings you the most joy? We have to start worshiping the God who gives laughter, not laughter itself. Last question. Last one here for you to think about. Whose applause do you long for? Now, this is a big one, isn't it? This is a big one. Where do you, where do you, find, where do you seek out applause? Where, where are you looking for it from? Whose approval are you longing for? Do you want it from your boss? Do you want your approval from your wife, from your parent, from your friends, from your coworkers? Who do you want the approval from? See, an, an idol is anything or anyone that takes, that, that's other than God, that takes the passion, the value, the hope, the glory, and the commitment of your life. That's what an idol is. Now, I have to tell you something, though, as I share all this. And you know what? I'm really sticking, sticking my neck out here a little bit because I really hope I'm not the only guy in this, this room that, that still does this. I have to admit, I, I still love sugary cereal, Okay. I know I'm really sticking my neck out there. I'm 36 years old. I ought to be getting over it by now, right? I mean, come on, grow up, Danny. No, sorry. I love sugary cereal. And I will tell you right now, my favorite cereal is right here. I love Lucky Charms. Lucky Charms is yummy. It's so good. You know what? I will admit it. In my cereal bowl, I still separate the marshmallows (laughs) from the grainy part of the cereal. You know, I eat the grainy part. And then I eat the marshmallows last, right? It's kind of like getting candy for breakfast, okay? I admit I still do it, okay? Well, when I was a kid, I can remember one time, um, I can remember one time, my mom would buy us Lucky Charms, and I don't know, maybe I never asked her, but maybe there were financially they were a little tight or something, and or maybe they were just trying to cut back on the budget a little. I don't know what. But she decided that that she was gonna do something different, but she didn't tell us. So what she would often do is she would take cereal. And put it in those plastic, you know, bins with the lid that comes off, you know. And so she'd put the Lucky Charms in there. Well, being at nine or ten years old, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention. And so she, uh, she decided when when she was on her budget uh, thing or whatever it was, and she she went to the store and she bought something else. I found out later it was these marshmallow mateys. Now, at first when I ate it, I, I thought, okay, something's not quite right here. You know, I didn't have the packaging; it was just poured in there, so I. I thought, something's not quite right, but, you know, I just kind of ate. But then after a while, she brought home this bag, and I saw this, and I'm like, what in the world? She's committing serial heresy here, you know? I mean, she is, she is providing for us a fake, right? In our culture, we are surrounded by cheap substitutes for God. Just like marshmallow mateys is a cheap substitute for Lucky Charms, right? We are surrounded by cheap substitutes by, of God. And, and you know what? It, it comes across very subtly. It's very subtle. We, we seek out our hope and our security and pleasure, but once in a while, what happens is, while we're in the midst of that, we think to ourselves, this can't really be all there is. Really? Can it be? We've settled for the sub- substitutes. God, over and over again in the Scripture, He addresses idolatry. And he says, don't, don't take the substitutes. And he warns Ahab he, through Elijah. He tells him a drought's coming. You're going to see. God says, you're going to see the real God. You're going to see the real one. You have to remember, realize Baal was a weather god. So that was why God chose to hold the rain away. They thought if they just worshiped Baal, he'd bring the rain back. Well, it didn't happen. God's saying, I'm going to show you. Baal is a substitute. Baal is is a cheap substitute for who I am. And so I guess, in a way, we shouldn't be surprised in our own lives when we run into droughts, right? 
when we start accepting the cheap substitutes in our life, when we start sitting around and we ask, is this really all there is to life? Maybe it's because we focus so much on things in our life that are the cheap substitutes of, for God. Maybe our careers have been that way. Maybe our, the money has been that way. And, and we've made them into gods and we think to ourselves, really, is this all there is to life? He withholds from Israel the rain because he wants to get their attention. But then there's the opposite as well. So many times God will just pour blessings on us when we put him first. When we make him first. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people. Uh, they'll, they're in counseling or just in a conversation and they'll say, Danny, you know, I was having all these problems. And, and I was trying to, I was focusing on all these things. And then I just decided one day, I'm like, you know what? I've got to pray and reestablish my relationship with God. And then everything just kind of seemed, just fell into place. Well, it didn't fall into place. God poured blessing out because you put him first. You know, this, this goes into a lot of things. You know, I've, I've experienced this myself when it comes to tithing, when it comes to giving to the church, giving to other people. Sometimes it doesn't always make sense on the ledger line. But God provides, and he blesses. That's what God does. Well, after telling all this to the king... Elijah says, you know what, let's have a showdown at Mount Carmel. It's God versus Baal, you know, the, the ultimate cage match, uh, wrestling match, right, between these two. And, and we have Elijah against Ahab and Jezebel. And then in verse Kings 18, 19, it says, Summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So everybody gets together. And then Elijah challenges the people. He, he looks at the people and he says to them, he says, how long, how long will you waver between two opinions? And then he says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if, if Baal is God, follow him. And then we read this. The people said nothing. Why did they say nothing? Because they wanted both God and Baal. See, they didn't speak up for Baal, they didn't speak up for God, but they didn't speak up against Baal or speak up against God because they wanted both. We want both, don't we, sometimes? I just want you to know that God doesn't share. <laughs> he doesn't share. The glory belongs to him. And so they gather together here on Mount Carmel and Elijah gives these instructions in verses 25 through 8. He says, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull given them, and they prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He starts, he starts talking a little bit of trash, all right? He says, shout louder, surely he's God. Perhaps he's in a deep thought. Maybe he's busy. He's, he's using the spiritual gift of sarcasm here, right? Okay, all right. And he says, well, maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's sleeping. Uh, maybe he's going to the bathroom. Maybe he's got to be woken up. So they shouted louder, and look what happens. They shout so loud, and they get so into this that they slash themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. What a tragic scene, huh? Bleeding for their false god. How ridiculous, right? How crazy. Cutting yourself for a false god? What were they? Don't we do the same? Don't we bleed for our false gods? We sacrifice everything for alcoholism. We give up a beautiful marriage for adultery. We... Sacrifice our kids for our careers. We still bleed. We still bleed for our false gods. And then if we look at the story, they bleed and nothing happens. And then Elijah gets his turn, and, and I'm going to kind of summarize, but he sets up the altar. He pours water on it. Not usually a good thing when you're wanting to have a fire be ignited by God, right? But that's what he does. And here's what he does. He just offers this simple prayer to God. He says, oh, God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob. Prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command, O Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Notice here, Elijah's not saying, hey, God, hey, I want to look good here. I want a victory, all right? So I need your fire to come down, all right? No, that's not what he says. He says, God, I want you to be given glory. And that's exactly what happens. His glory comes down. And in verse 38, immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. The story is about the glory of God, isn't it? That's what this is about. That's what the entire story is, not just this story. And see, idolatry is not just offensive to God, but it hurts God. I think we, we, we forget that. God does have feelings. Idolatry hurts God because he's jealous and he loves us and he wants us. It's interesting, Ezekiel, another prophet of God, says that idolatry, he refers to it as idolatry is, is like cheating on God. It's like having an affair on God. There's another prophet one of, one of the more interesting prophets that we probably, I've, I don't know that I've ever preached on him, but I should, is Hosea, the prophet Hosea. Hosea is, a, is an interesting story because God tells Hosea to marry a prostitute. Think about that. How would you feel if I wasn't married and I come up one day and said, okay, everybody, God called me to go to the red light district and I'm marrying a prostitute next week. How would you feel about that? But that's what God called him to do. God says, I want you to go marry a prostitute. And so Hosea's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll, all right, sure, I'll, I'll do what you say. And so he marries her. Well, after some time, though, he comes home one day, and she's gone. And so, you know, he's tempted, I'm sure, to say, well, all right, this is a mistake. I just leave her, let her go. But no, God says, I want you to go find her. And so what does he do? He goes and he finds her. And what is she doing? She's prostituting herself again. And so I'm sure then God said, oh, okay, well, okay, Hosea, you're off the hook. Don't worry about it. That's not what happened. Hosea is told by God this. He tells, he tells Hosea, go and love your wife again. Even though she commits adultery with another lover, this will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Wow, what a powerful story. You know what? There he's referring to Israel, but that Israel is us. Even though we've given ourselves over so many times to false gods, God's still looking for us. God's still looking for you. That was the whole purpose of the cross. The whole purpose of the cross was a sacrifice so that he could regain us. He bought us back. You know what? We've offended and we have hurt God. Maybe we've belittled God. Maybe we've turned him in just into an hour of church service every week. But God is still trying to tell us. He's still saying to you, he's saying, I love you. And I'm pursuing you. I want you. The prophets warn us, as I close up here, the prophets warn us that nothing or no one is to sit on the throne of our hearts but God. No one. And so here today, it can, we can have a new start. Maybe, we've, maybe through that list I gave you, the seven questions, right? Maybe you've identified what some of those gods are in your life. This is an opportunity for you to, to change that. God is pursuing after you. And he wants you. Isn't it time to stop running? Isn't it, start time, isn't it time to turn around and start running back toward him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your message today, for your word. And I thank you for the prophets who stood boldly and firmly and were committed, were committed to your message, committed to your truth. Father, because they loved the people so much that they wanted to warn them. They wanted to, to lead them away from the precipice that the cliff, God, that they were about to go over. And God, here today, maybe for maybe all of us in here, you're putting up this warning sign. You're saying, don't step over that cliff. God, 
Sometimes these idols in our lives are just so subtle, we don't notice them. God, give us new eyes to be able to see them. And Father, we thank you that you're, you're there waiting. You're pursuing. You're, you want us. Even though we've committed affairs and adultery against you, you're, you're, you still want us. So God, here in these next few moments, I just pray you would work in all of our hearts, whether we stay in our seats or we step forward with the decision, God, that, that Father, we all make a decision today, God, to make you the one on the throne of our life, of our hearts, of our minds. And God, I thank you for your son, your son Jesus who died so that we could, we could experience this new relationship with you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.